I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. I feel like the band is finally back together. Uh, We were missing Zach last week. He was in parts unknown doing things we can't know about and uh, always working to the next deal, which we appreciate that, Zach. You're always out there on the front lines finding ways for us to be able to spread the word, and we appreciate your expertise. We we give you a hard time, but I just wanted to say thank you. I feel like we need an intervention here. (laughs) So, like, when my kids became quiet or secretive... And you got nervous. It always got my attention. It, was, we, it, we, it wasn't we. when they were being, you know, belligerent or in need of discipline because I'm looking at it. Missy's like, what are you going to do about these kids? I'm like, well, we're going to deal with it. They but when they it. get quiet or you're not seeing them, then I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what are they up So to? every time I would see them after a long period, I would always say the same thing. I said, I got a question for you. I haven't been seeing you around. <laughs> You're like the person at church when the guys, all of a sudden they show up. You're like, where where you been? So I would ask the same question. I said, now look, I hadn't been seeing you. So just go ahead and tell me, have you been up to anything illegal or immoral? <laughs> Can you answer that question, Zach, with, with full moral clarity? You're getting hot under the collar here, man. <laughs> I, I, yeah, my technique is you say, uh, you, you don't tell them anything, you just say, all right, tell me all about it. And they're like, <laughs> what do you mean? Because well, you, they're you know not what sure I mean. what you know. Yeah, they don't know. And I, I and just, you, you, know you know what I'm talking about. You know about, what that means. That, that means that you've worked with a lot of college kids through the years. Oh, yeah. that, that actually happened with my oldest son. I Zachary like, is, is in a, with a group that's uh, in the little book of Titus. It's interesting that eight times in a three chapter book yeah eight times during that deal it says one who loves what is good that that's number one there's a group that was a member of the kingdom they claim to know god but by their actions they deny him they are detestable disobedient and unfit for doing anything good you read down a little bit. Is that uh, with this group, or he's no, not? No, this, this is individuals. Oh, okay. He's the older women. He went with them first to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to much wine. They, they drink a little, but not much. But they teach what is good. That's three. Number four, similarly, include the young men to be self-controlled and everything. Set them an example by doing what is good, that's four times. The fifth time, let's see, the grace of God has brought the passion to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives, waiting on the, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own and the fourth time in this little book, eager to do what is good. And the last chapter three, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. That's that's uh, six. Number seven, uh, uh, this is the trustworthy saying. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing good. That's seven. And number eight, our people must learn, the last chapter, to devote themselves after saying this all the way up to now, seven times in three chapters. The last one is, our people must learn to devote themselves to do what is good. In order that, they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. Pretty amazing that in one little book, eight times he mentions doing what is good, which I had a little sermon on that Sunday morning. I had a feeling you did. Oh, I did too. 
Yep. So, yep. Zach, when you're, other, when you're away, I think Phil's point is make sure you're doing what is so good. So, my question to you, Zach, have you been he doing a, what is good? He has a good. reputation of doing mm. what? what is good. Yeah. He fits the mold. Uh, well, I will tell you, I was with my family the entire time. So, that's a good <laughs> – if, if, if you want accountability – It's good. It's, it's you, a good yeah. thing. And he yeah, has a lot of you. eyes. He has a lot of eyes in that family. So, yeah. Y'all are Bible study. You, y'all are – no, that's excellent, Dad. That's a great point. I mean, and you're right. That'll it, preach. Yeah, it'll preach. And it's an yeah. older man telling a younger man how to make it in ministry. Yeah. You got to yeah. do what's good. Yeah. Or they're not going to listen yeah. to you. You know, it's not like it's it's this deep uh, thing you have to get into. It's pretty it. simple. Pretty simple. Just do good. So how many, after heard that message, um, hit the water yesterday? Because when I walked in, you were baptizing. Two. Two, and then there were three more after. Oh, was that right? Yeah, there were three more later. Four, five. Yep. So that's pretty impressive. You know, a lot of people, you know, try to make too much. uh, What's the word? You can get to where you forget to do small things. Yep. But doing good is a big thing. Yep. Or he wouldn't have told Titus eight times. Yeah. I mean, with each chapter, there were two, four, six. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. No, that's a good point. That's excellent. In fact, that's kind of the core. Well, he said they, the the ones that are having tr- they're having trouble with they claim uh, to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They're, it's de- de- detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So doing good should be one of the hallmarks of the sons and daughters of God, in my opinion. Yep, I agree. And I think you have to have clarity and understand truth to even know what good is. You know, you think about it, if you look at that, you say, and you can do that without a, you know, four-point OQ, you know, know-it-all type individual. High IQ, yeah. You say, what about doing, does he do any good? Is he doing a lot of good? They're like, what? (laughs) It's not not, not a deep enough concept, but it's there. A little book of Titus. No, and the, Dad, you remember um, years ago we had a, a group of people that had started teaching something that's not in the Word, but they taught it, that the only time the Holy Spirit operated was when you were reading your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, the smarter you are, the more spirit you have. And there could be nothing further from the, that. That's not truth, because the truth is you have the Holy Spirit no matter how smart you are. That's right. I mean, from a person with zero, low IQ to high IQ, the Holy Spirit still does his work. Well, it does work, you know, yeah. through the Word, but sure. it also it indwells you. Right. He kind of makes the point that uh, that younger buck, that this right here, but will keep you from living a sinful life. Right. You're busy doing good. Right. You say, well, how deep is good doing good? It's not deep, but it's sure, sure, you can sure Well, you know it. what's interesting is with that particular doctrine is that most of the people we're reading about in these texts were illiterate. Yep. They couldn't even read. Yeah. So they were full of the Holy Spirit doing amazing spiritual things, and they couldn't even read. And there was no Bible. Yeah. You know, there was the few. They were not very scholarly. Yeah, exactly. So. I mean, Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians 1 when he said, you know, Christ sent me to preach the gospel. Yep. Not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied yep. of its power. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. You don't want to put it and on. And he your doubled own. down on it, saying, you know, I, I didn't come to you with eloquence or superior wisdom, but I just shared the testimony about God. You know, two times it says our people must learn to devote themselves to doing good. And on above there, they may be careful to devote themselves. To doing good. Yeah. So um, I want to mention, before we get back to our text, uh, and we're in Luke 20 today, is um, I, I realize we got a timing issue because we're still recording before Christmas. This is going to release after. But I, last night's the first night I've been able to watch your Christmas special oh, yeah. for Duck Family Treasure, and it was outstanding. I mean, it was as good as any episode of our other duck show that we did. Um, high quality. It was funny, but it was very spiritual mind at the end. It was a great close talking about why we celebrate Jesus. Chase did a Is great that job. Is giving you a, a 
something you can stand on saying where, where I was pretty proud that on national TV yeah you had the opportunity to get into the weeds about why Jesus is Lord and he's the I made the point on the episode that he's not the reason for the season he's the reason for every season yeah yeah which is good and, and gave some reasons why yep and I have to say I thought as good as everybody was uh, my favorite two people were, I guess, sort of new to being having that much uh, airtime on a episode. It was Reed and Austin, the two young bucks, because they were kind of like learning on the job was kind of the basis of them being in, out in the field. And but it was family together too, which was kind of cool. But I just thought they were both excellent. I both sent, I sent them both a text last night and told them, you know, you guys knocked it out of the park. So I loved well, it, and yeah. I didn't realize till I was watching the credits last night when they were rolling through at the bottom. That Zach is an executive producer, Zach and Corey. I didn't know that. Yeah, it'd be hard to know that. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised yeah. that kind of material would wind up on television. Yeah, I was I was proud of it. So, Zach, you're right there. You're right there with the... Well, I think Zach kind of helped the deal happen with yeah. the show, and then we never saw him again. <laughs> But, you know, it is was that, something. Is that the way it works? Sometimes you you're just an executive in, in, producer. In this case, you, you, did. I, you got to remember this thing started because I, I, I saw you. all. Jace, you remember how this started? You were, yeah, you were on, a pod, this, on this yeah. podcast. It was on the Unashamed podcast. Yeah, Unashamed and I, and Nation him and, made it Him that. and Jeff were talking, and I was like, that's a show. And he's like, well, you, if you get the get the votes, we had the whole thing that happened. Yep. Um, and then I pitched it to Fox, and we end up bringing in another production partner. And um, but Jace has kind of done most of the heavy lifting on. Yeah, a lot when of it, the, and that's obvious. In our culture, that what they were doing made more sense than ninety percent of what you see come and go on television shows. I mean, yeah, some of them are just downright pathetic. Well, yeah. the and the showrunner is. Deserves a lot of credit. She's amazing. Her, her name's Jenna. She's a believer and just awesome. I loved her on the other on our first show, and back then she was just a PA, I guess, or something. I don't know what she did. Oh, she's so a, when she's, will you know about the ebb and flow on what people are kind of thinking last night? You know, yeah, I don't know. Up. I don't know if you'll ever know. But <laughs> I don't. Know. It's a different world with it, all that. I mean, yeah. it really is. It's hard to measure success of something anymore like you used to could because this is a digital platform show. It happened to be on a network last night, but exactly. you know, it's, it's hard to say. But the reason I brought that up, Zach, about that is because I wanted our audience to know we, we poke a lot of fun at you when you're not here, but you've got a lot of uh, irons in the fire, as they say, and that's a perfect example of one that's – worked out really well i mean it's it's they really weren't well. afraid you know to do things like throw biscuits to one another yeah <laughs> no it's fine it's a fun show it's good clean fun and so uh yeah i was proud of it i think so for those good. who didn't get to see the episode what give us the verdict on yeah, the, crawfish we had the cliffhanger pie. We could, yeah the crawfish pie now, this is going to be a shock to you. It was actually better than any crawfish pie I've ever eaten. Because you'd just come in from... No, I just think they, you know, took Kay's recipe, and it was all like, will they pull it off? Will they not? You know, I was 50-50 at best. It was absolutely it looked fantastic. outstanding. And I loved... Look, the... we ate both of those pies just right there. Yeah. I mean, I looked around... Which is not the... easy to do on a TV meal because we did it yeah. for years she couldn't like, get off of it yeah so she's got that which by the way i love the nod to mom she did a little cameo with a little facetime cameo and that meant a lot to me because that was very nostalgic like they were doing mom's recipe and so they actually got her on the phone which was cool so it, it was i weird. hate to tell you this it wasn't even planned they just you know missy was the pressure was mounting <laughs> Because I just said, look, if this is a disaster. So I assume that was part of the play. You're saying that was a can I kind of phone a well, friend. They they looked at a recipe and and <laughs> Jessica had made her own pie crust and she's like, this recipe is nothing like what I do. And so they're like, well, call her up, roll camera. Well, that was good. Yeah. So that because you noticed they only filmed it from our yeah. perspective. Right. 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 She answered. Now the first time she answered. She just went off, started talking about, and they were like trying to get, they was like, okay, we're actually filming a, 
Because <laughs> mom answers the phone in a story. Like it's like we we I just left you a minute ago and let me pick that story up where I left off. That's the way when she when I call her, that's the way she starts. Yeah. Well, you're not believe your dad, and then she goes into the story, and I haven't even said hello, or we're not even into why I'm calling yet. So, well, last night when she called me after the episode, it, so I, she called me, but I, we, you know, we were had a lot of people over. We had a little viewing last Watch night, party. so I had to call her back. But she was on the phone with me when you called. Because she said, oh, there's Jace. I need to go. So and I, I was like, praise the Lord for yeah. Jace. So I called her back. And when she answered, I said, well, what did you think about the episode? And then she was like, oh, I cried all the way through it. Yeah, so. it, was, it was touching. It was great. Let's take a break. So we got our face paint on. It's duck season. When you go duck hunting, if exactly. you don't have face paint on, they'll see your face shining. Right. And flare. So that's why you're wearing the face paint. Oh, yeah. As a perfect. So we shot four. We we should have shot six. We had six come in the decoys, but it was a blind we hadn't hunted all year. And the brush has grown up in front of the blind. So when the ducks come in the decoys, you can't shoot them. It's a bad. That's not good. We're waiting to get them in the decoys. They get in, you come, and you're shooting through brush. Yeah, not good. Low, low brush. So we were struggling, and uh, but we made a couple long shots, and we wound up with four nice wood ducks. But we 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 just don't have many ducks. Yeah. So, well, it's uh, funny because I didn't realize that, and so just jokingly, I asked Joe, who's Jersey Joe, who's turned into the new Cy. Oh for man, claiming ducks, and so I was like, so I hear you're the big shooter of the blind now. What'd you what'd you do today? Well, apparently he finally has humbled himself because he said, I felt like I was a blind man trying to shoot today. And I was like, okay. Well, we've come a long way because Jersey Joe didn't realize that uh, I'm going to say what everybody's thinking. (laughs) And so I snapped at him two or three times in the blind, not unlike any other time that I would do with anybody, including members of my family. I mean, this is just how I'm in charge of let's get the ducks in as close as possible. And so when somebody's doing something, you know, they were shuffling around one, they flared some ducks and I was like, Hey, stay down and get your head under the roof. Well, it's nothing personal. And I didn't say, Hey, Joe, (laughs) you know, I just fired that toward the end of the blind and then there was a one time they came on their side, raised up, emptied their guns, nothing. Yeah. And I was like, look, maybe y'all should do next time, keep your eyes open while you're shooting. <laughs> you know, it was just a jab. But I noticed he, he started getting a little wounded. A little wounded. So, well, what capped it off was opening day of the second split was just a couple of days ago. So I'm driving the boat, and it's very difficult to drive the boat in shallow water because we, we don't have much water. So me and Phil are in the back. I'm driving, and Phil's right beside me because Phil realizes you have to have an equal weight distribution right. to get this motor, the propeller down in the water, where to go. So we have three guys who are all at the front of the boat, Jersey Joe, Burley, and the nurse chad the nurse i'm gonna say that they average about 280 would you say 250 280 i don't know what will you say phil so i'm pretty heavy they're pretty heavy <laughs> big so, boys so i'm back here trying you to get that the, the lightest out of the five get the propeller down i'm struggling and I keep thinking that they're, they're going to move back because they realize that we're moving at less than one mile an hour. I mean, we're 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 floating. Everything dried up, so we had to pump. Yeah, around the clock. Yeah, for a month just, just to have what you have. To, so here's what I get said: get a boat up through there. The water's so shallow, the propeller's dragging in the mud. Yep. So you kind of get it to where you. Well, it was out. Of, it was out of the you water. It was one heavy back where so y'all were. That, so I said, "Hey, one of you fat boys, move <laughs> back toward the back of the boat." <laughs> oh, well, boy. Jersey Joe jumped up like we was, you know, walking outside. Uh, 
<laughs> and but he had a weight uh, issue few, a few years back, and he said two hundred and eighty or something. Well, he's said, gotten he big. Got well, he he. So he got back, and then the propeller went down in the water, and we took off. So I thought, oh, happy. He said, I think me and you, I can't do his accent. I think me and you need to work on our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, at the time, I couldn't see who was who because of all the clothes and all your heads are pointing the other way. So I thought fat boy might get your attention. <laughs> and, well, the I, good news and apparently is, it did. Yeah. When, when uh, the, the reason Jersey just... Got rid of all of his stuff and sold uh, sold his house and said I, we're going to Louisiana and I listened to some dudes talking. I want to be like them. Yep. So he told his wife. That's why he came said, here. Are you kidding me? He said, he said no. We're going to Louisiana. I mean, with everything we have, we're leaving and we're yeah. going to Louisiana. We're getting out of town. So I find city life is not doing it for us. That's right. So I finally Ain't told him, I said, here's here's the deal. When we're duck hunting, we're buddies. I said, we we challenge each other, we joke with each other. I said, but always remember, I'm unoffendable. And when we're duck hunting, you need to be the same way. That's right. I said, so remember this rule since we're working on our relationship. If I don't have a duck call in my hand or my Bible in my hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I said, I just made a joke here. And I figured that if you're over 250, if you don't, if you're offended that I'm calling you a fat boy, that's on you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're fat. <laughs> so now. You didn't say, hey, you morbidly obese people. No, no front, I just. You just said fat boy. I, which, yeah. I, I said, if because. If I'd have been up there, I'd have popped in the back. I wouldn't have I thought I said, because y'all weren't paying attention to the struggle either. So I was doing it to try to get your attention. I wanted to make you, you mad because y'all are not being concerned that if we, at this rate, we will not be home before dark. <laughs> So he said, well, now that I know that, it all makes sense. I said, well, see? Yeah. I love it. Leave everything at the boathouse. It's just, yeah. it's, mm. leave it all there. It's good, clean. I, and then I made a point that we're too sensitive in our world now. I was like, right. no, that is true. Hurt, you know, and I was like, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And you can dish it out on me as much as you want. Yeah. I said, because I can take it, buddy. That's right. No, you're right. And that's why we talked about this when we had the comedian on a few podcasts back. Self-deprecation is the key to everything. I mean, you have to just yeah. be honest about who you are. It's like when I get go to New York, we used to go to New York a lot, and they said, oh, you're going to shop for some clothes. I was like, I looked in two stores in New York and realized there's no fat people here. I mean, I, I don't guess, because they're not selling clothes for anything but super skinny people. So fat boys like me idle up in New York, so you have to be able to look at it. I like it. Let's take another break. All right, well, let's get to our text. I did have a near-death experience yesterday, and uh, so it's at times that, that, you know, like that you get clarity and realize the resurrection is real. So I had a moment. I had a response after your sermon yesterday. So the near-death was after my sermon? After your sermon. Because I talked about being kingdom-ready in my sermon at the end of it. So my wife said, uh, will you go get Karina from the airport today? Because all the family's coming in. You know, it's just nearing Christmas. I was like, sure. So she said that when we woke up yesterday. Because didn't, we didn't go duck hunting. We were we were on the... We yeah, had the Fox and Friends. Yeah, Fox and Friends show. Well, I assumed that at some point during the day, she was going to let me know what time I was supposed to go do that. Because she had a young girl uh, at our house, uh, you know, from a broken home. She was just trying to mentor, you know, and uh, my wife's good at stuff like that. And so they're, you know, they're sitting there wrapping presents and talking, having a Bible study. I mean, it was all good stuff. And then she was like, Jace. I said, what? She said, Karina just landed at the airport. Of course, we were. I was like, great. <laughs> How would I have known that? She said, I asked you this morning if you would go get her. I was like, well, you never said what time. I just figured you'd say, hey, she'd be landing. She was like, 
you you gotta go get her. So I got my truck, took off. Like Karina was gonna have a problem waiting ten minutes at the airport. Well, it right. took her a month to get out of her own country. So I'm on the interstate, and you know where the uh, civic center is. You're up on a. It's like a bridge. Yeah. There's no way to get off. You know. It's not but, like a bridge. It track, is a bridge. Yeah, it's a bridge. But it's a long bridge. It's like an overpass. With a lot of people in. coming on and getting off. It's, it's pretty it's very narrow. dangerous, yeah. And the traffic was heavy. So yep. there's no, I wasn't hurriedly getting there because it. I could only bumper to bumper. So I'm there, and all of a sudden, this 18-wheeler, I'm almost to his cab, and it just starts coming over into my lane. And I'm, I'm I start moving over. Well, then I blow the horn. He just keeps coming. And... Then he just hit me, and but we, you know, it, it just, it's like if, the, I think if there hadn't been too many cars there, and when he started bumping it, it was like I was in a NASCAR race, <laughs> and every time he would hit me, it would, you know, my, my truck was, and I'm just laying on the horn, and then he finally started eat, but he was, he was squeezing me up against the railing. Yeah. Of course, I didn't think it was that bad. I didn't think, hey, maybe I should get his license plate if there's any damage. But you can, you know, when I picked her up, I realized, you know, he had scratched my truck up pretty good uh -huh. just with the bumping and the grinding. But <laughs> you but, might should have read one of those billboards that says, yeah. oh, so and so. But in the moment, you know, in the five seconds that I was bouncing up against his rig and this rail, I thought, I could possibly die. It's not people you, get you know, killed because I, I I tried to slow down, but there was somebody right behind me. You yeah. know? They, and of course, they're in a smaller car. They were hugging the rail too. But this guy just who knows what? Probably on his phone or whatever. But I'm just bah, bah. <laughs> all my frustrations and near death experiences going through that car horn. <laughs> and so when I got up next side of him, you know, I was trying to look who it was, and he turned his head. You know, like I don't want you to see me. <laughs> I just pop back on the horn, you know. But then it made me think, boy, I'm glad I'm in on the resurrection because uh, you know there was happen. literally nothing I could do. There was nowhere to go, and he did a bunch of damage to my truck. And you know, I just thought, well, I'm gonna use it for the Lord. So <laughs> that's pretty funny. I was gonna say he may have been listening to our podcast because a lot of guys on the roads do. I, I mean, a lot of truckers that listen, so who knows? If you're listening, you did that. I know you didn't mean to. Repent. Repent. Mm. Get ready for the kingdom. So we're in Luke chapter 20, Zach, since you hadn't been with us for a, a time. But give your outline. Oh, so Al preached yesterday, and you basically went through, did you start in 20? I started in 19. Al went 19, 20, 21. Yep. I did three chapters, Zach, in about 27 minutes. Three chapters in Luke. It was actually fantastic. It was more like you, a lecture. You, did you read Did you read the chat? I did whole, not read okay. the text. No, it was the only thing I didn't do. You I just, I just told the story and referenced the text, but I couldn't read it because there was no, I could, if okay. I'd have read it, that'd have been half the sermon. You'd have still been there. Yeah. So I, what I did was, is I left it up to the people to read the whole text. I just gave a massive overview of what we've been talking about on this podcast, and I did it in one sermon, and it was my own fault. Like Jay's is right, it was kind of poor planning to have to get down that much text in a sermon series. Yeah. But you know, we're at the end of the year and the end of the book. But but to Jay's point, so I went back, and in my intro leading up to it, I gave that picture of all the people that Jesus interacted with, and it was really interesting because when you, it's like anything else, when you take a little bit higher view of a text. You see what Luke was trying to do here. We've talked about this, but it's a good time to do it again as we're going in this last segment here. Is all those people that he was interacting with, even including the rich young ruler, it was all about the way the kingdom life was going to be. And it was usually people that it was, remember, it was little kids, it was uh, the blind guy, Zacchaeus. Most of them were people that just basically said, you know, this is the guy. And except for one who then couldn't get past his own success, you know, which is kind of interesting to then embrace the kingdom because he liked this life, what he had accomplished better, which then leads to the big triumphal entry, which we've talked about. And this was a huge moment because this is the king recognizing. So I read a bunch of texts that we've shared on the podcast, all those prophecies that pointed to this moment. This was a huge moment. 
and and we we have you don't you don't have to oversell it. I mean, it's big. And Jace made the point in past podcasts that when Jesus orchestrates the way something's going to look to the level he did for that entry, that meant this was a big deal. Yeah, but it was. But I kind of flipped it because we talked about it. It was not really a triumphal entry as much as it was a very humble. You know what hit me that we didn't talk about on the podcast when you were talking about that is that I'm sure it was funny looking. Yeah, it's like you made the point that it wasn't this grand horns blowing. He was on a donkey that had never been ridden. Yep. And it's like, this is your king? And I'm sure it was, I just picture it like scooting real fast and he just hanging on, you know, and just, and I'm sure they were, some people, especially the people, the Pharisees and who weren't all about this, I'm sure they just thought, what a comedy this is. I mean, this is this, he's a carpenter. Right. From Nazareth, riding on a donkey. Yep. This is the king. This is the king. This is the Messiah. Yeah. And I mentioned that the crowd in a one week he's going to do a U-turn and head back out of the city and carrying a cross. And nobody's yelling, son of man, son of David. Everybody's just kind of like watching this tragedy unfold the way they're thinking about it. Yeah. And so, but the first thing he does is he goes to the temple and I made the point that we've made. There was a reason why he did that. And Luke lays it out beautifully. And John does too in John 2, but he just puts it in a different place in the story. But the whole idea was is he's going to reclaim his house. Yeah. And, and, and he's doing it for not the purpose that you would think, but he's doing it for the purpose of saying that I'm going to build a house way better than this one, and which is ultimately what he does. Which is ultimately us. I kept thinking... I hope you say we are his house, and yeah, you did. And I did, right. It was good. You also made another good point that you blew past, but when you talked about Zacchaeus and the tax collector. Oh, yeah. And tax collector, which is, you know, we're going to revisit that in chapter 20, which you got into paying taxes to Caesar, which nobody likes to do. And I thought you might go back to that yeah. and say, you know, what? why would he go to a, He's already gone to a tax collector's house in public. But you, I love that question. You said, well, he was the one willing to climb a tree for Jesus. Would right. you climb a tree for Jesus? And when you look at it through the Pharisees and what we're going to see, the Sadducees' eyes, the answer would be no. They wouldn't do it. So I read that text that says, unless we become like little children, we will not receive the kingdom of heaven. I read that, and I had never thought about that before either, that Zacchaeus was like a kid. I mean, he's, he's a wealthy man that nobody really likes, but he climbed a tree. I mean, what, what man climbs a tree just to see another man? But, uh, but then I asked the audience. Collector. Yeah, I asked the audience, would you climb a tree? Yeah, and somebody thing. said, yes. <laughs> somebody <laughs> yelled out. That's probably yes. Kirk Lively. Yeah, it probably you know, was. A, it was a There's good a, question. That's a, it was a really good practical question, especially when you're putting yourself out there in an embarrassing way. People already don't like you because you're a tax collector. Yeah. And then you're climbing a tree. And they're like, what an idiot. What is a Look spectacle? How short that guy is, <laughs> you know. Right. I hate that well, guy. Well, there's, there's the... Um, I think the the mindset of the Pharisees and really kind of all of Israel here in this in this moment is highlighted because you think about when we've been going through the book of Isaiah at our church, um, which there's a lot of it's got nestled into the study of a lot of these prophecies, these messianic prophecies that uh, and, and, the, and not just the messianic prophecies, but the also prophecies of the coming of the kingdom as well. And the this triumphal entry is prophesied in Zechariah chapter nine, and and so there's this whole idea that the prophets from the old had all pointed to what Jesus is doing here, and not just the coming of the Messiah for the forgiveness of sins, which that's part of it, but also the coming of the Messiah for the establishment of the kingdom, the coming of the King. He's, he is Savior, but he's also King, Priest, Prophet. I mean, he's all of it. And and all of this is coming to this fruition here. And I think that what nobody got, at least a lot of the Pharisees, they didn't understand how, th from the beginning, God's desire was for the nations. It wasn't just for a particular group of people. It was for all people. And so you see it 
when he goes into um, the temple and he says, which I don't think it's an accident that that's the first place that he went. No, nope, he either. goes into the temple and he began to drive those out who were selling, saying to them, it is written and my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a, a, rob, a robber robber's den. Um, in other parts of other gospels, when uh, it says that you've made uh, that actually the actual phrase here is it, it is written. My house shall be a house of prayer for the nations. That's actually what he's quoting. He's, yeah. The quote, the real quote is it's a house of prayer for the nations. And so you go all the way back to like a prophet like Isaiah, and you could go to any of the prophets, but Isaiah is a, a great one to look at. Um, in the second chapter of Isaiah, he builds this vision of a, a, a mountain, temple mountain, you know, Zion, Zion uh, the, the temple was on a mountain. And this, and this, this new temple that sits on, on top of the mountain and the vision that Isaiah uh, paints is that all the nations are coming up this hill to the top to worship the one true God, which is, by the way, what uh, what he is laying the seed for here is that vision that was prophesied about. He's these guys, these New Testament writers and Jesus himself, what what they're accomplishing is they're actually explaining what was the vision the entire time in the Old Testament that was going to be fulfilled here, that there would be a new temple established. The, the one that you've turned into a den of robbers, like that's coming down. That's what he's going to tell us on the Mount of Olives, you know, very soon after this, that temple's coming down. And then, and then God's going to re, uh, establish a new temple, which is going to be Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. And then where there's lit, we are the people, we, we're it, we're the temple. We're being built upon him. So yep. I think it's this, incredible like moment here this is not just you know we don't just get nuggets of, of wisdom and and values out of this text this is actually a picture and an explanation of god's full scheme of redemption i mean this is it he is painting that picture i made the point zach that just like he cleaned out that temple of hypocrisy um you know thieves liars, double-minded people, uh, just like he did that is what happens to us when we embrace Christ and become Christians is he cleans out that stuff in us too by putting yeah. the Holy Spirit in us. And so it is amazing that it happens at an individual level, what he did at a building level in this thing. And so that, again, that was a foreshadow of what was coming. And I made the point Yet, even when he was 12 years old, you remember Luke 2, that whenever his parents found him, he said, why, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? So even at 12 years old, he had a recognition of his house and and what that meant and the idea of the presence there, which is very powerful. And then somebody made the point to me after the sermon. They said, do you think him being in there, he was there three days, had something to do with the fact that the, the three days? And I said, well, there's very few accidents when it comes to Jesus, what he did. So you're right. It was probably another foreshadowing of what that meant as well. Because remember the temple yeah. curtain tore in half when he died. And then three days later, of course, he was resurrected. So then you get to this text, and so the way I put it was the eternal king and the eternal high priest, now they've been established, he's going to sit down and hold court at the temple because he's going to teach seven different messages in Luke 20 and 21, which is what we'll spend the next few podcasts talking about. And we started into the first one, the, the last podcast, which is Luke 21 through 8, um, which is them questioning his authority. And then he comes back the next section and talks about the tenants. He tells another parable. And then he talks about Caesar and the what that means about the paying taxes, which I talked a little bit about yesterday in my lesson. And then really interesting one that I would have loved to have gotten into, but I had no time yesterday in Luke 20, 27 through 39, was about focusing on eternal relationships because they questioned him about marriage and the resurrection. And these were the Sadducees on that one. Yeah. And I did make a point yesterday. I just want to say this because a guy texted me afterwards and he quoted what I said. And he said, man, did I need to hear that? Because he's having some marriage problems. When I, I said, just at a practical level, when Lisa and I understood and became brother and sister over husband and wife, our marriage changed for the better. 
And I was making the yeah. point that spiritual life elevates you in a marriage relationship. And Jace talks a lot about this with his relationship with Missy. And that's so true. The, and I think that's the ultimate point he makes about this life and the next one. But anyway, we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, then the, fifth, the fourth one, fifth one, was he abhors hypocrisy, which that's when he gets into the elites and what they were all about. Uh, he, the little widow that gave everything, he talked about her because he just observed it at the temple. And then the last one is when he gives a clear picture of this destruction of Jerusalem, which is going to happen in their lifetime. And he basically says, you got to be ready. And so that's kind of how I close my sermon. But that was my sermon yesterday. Uh, WFRchurch.org, if you want to check it out and see the whole thing. It's called The King Has Come. So there was that. So I did a. I, th- I think it's good to get an overview before we get into the details because I do think you're realizing he's claiming to be the king. He says the kingdom is at hand. He keeps making references to the temple as in he may be the new temple. Yep. Where heaven and earth intersect, God and people meet. Which here's a human saying he's the son of God. So it makes sense. So they start questioning his authority. What you know, I, I've been studying a lot of history because if you kind of know what was going on then, some of this makes more sense. Uh, and I'm not sure where I got this, but twenty years before twenty or so years before Jesus does this, there was a guy named Judas the Galilean, and his platform was he refused to pay the head tax of Caesar, which is what we're going to get into that conversation in chapter 20, verse 20 through uh, 26. So just think about, though, the context. You know, 20 years before, we had a, a revolutionary who was like, we're not going to pay taxes because it was a, it was a uh, citizen tax. You basically paid this tax as a, as a right to be a part of the Roman Empire. Well, it was it was like the mob, you know. It was like exactly. it was I, like racket protection. <laughs> it was like here, yeah. you're going to pay me money so you won't get attacked. And they're like, well, who would attack me? And they're like, oh, we will. <laughs> so it's like so no, you pay me money so I don't attack you. That's what the Romans were saying. You pay money to be a citizen so that we won't kill you. Many ways of stealing the people's money. <laughs> well, exactly. Right, exactly. Well, that's where I'm going with this because so so that he led a revolt to not to pay the taxes. Then he had well a revolution not to pay the taxes. Then a revolt against the temple to cleanse the temple. Yep. Same same kind of mode. Yeah. And. And his message was, God will be our king and not Caesar. Well, they caught him, beat him, and killed him. And that revolution died right there. But 20 years later, it's like, well, here's Jesus. Well, we got another one. And what I was fascinated to see is there was 12 revolutionary types during this time period, the more history I read, of people, because they didn't like being under Roman rule. They didn't like paying these taxes, and they didn't like what was going on in the temple, and they sure didn't like that Caesar, which is what I didn't really realize when I was reading all this history, is that they were saying, God has put us in charge. I mean, this is, God has shown favor on us, or we wouldn't be in charge. Right. So, and you you get that when you actually look at the coin, when the coin that was in discussion that and and I noticed that on the coin it basically has Tiberius Caesar, son of the god Augustus, Pontifus Maximus, which is high priest. So just think about that. He's king, he's a son of a god, and he's the high priest. Well, what's he claiming here? <laughs> yeah. So that that is the problem, and I think it's like what you said about the the Godfather or, or the mob. You know, they had been a republic, Rome, for years and years and decades, and now all of a sudden they're turning into a monarchy. But they're doing it in light of, but God has made us like this, and what the idea is, it's kind of like our government today. You know, you're like, well, we're 
you know, we're a republic and people are free, but the people in charge, you're free to be who you are as long as you agree with the people in charge. Because right. if you don't, guess what? They kill you. <laughs> and uh, and that that's kind of how this this works, because then they, they say we should be in charge. God has put us in charge to do good things. And it's kind of like you made about the the mob. You know, they, they'll do things just as a cover with the money that they are stealing or right. you know, murdering people. And then they'll go, they'll do something in public that's, that's something good. Right. That kind of cover. They're like, and it all comes down to who's in charge. Yeah. Who's going to be in charge if the power and let us run this thing. But if you challenge us, and I think that's why they're challenging his authority. So he's getting it from every angle. He's getting it from the religious and they're threatening, they're trying to get him on record saying something that defies Roman decrees, right. and because they they want to get rid of him. He's That's a threat right. to everybody in power. And unfortunately, these religious people love their power. Yeah. And that that's what's happening. I mean, I made you, you're that, seeing seven different examples of it. I, mean, I quoted that quote that you did on the podcast, Jace, that, that someone, you heard somebody say it, but the kingdom of God is... Not about the love of power, but the power of love and how that flips. And so everything you're seeing and what you described in earthly kingdoms is about the love of power. And certainly our culture and our country are no different. I mean, um, and what oppressed people say is, yeah, but if you put me in charge, I'll change it for the people. And then they get in charge, they have throughout human history, and they become tyrants and oppressors like the people before them. I mean, again, if you're not doing this in a servant mentality that's laid out by Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, you're always going to wind up with more tyranny, which I think, Zach, you wrote a movie about this that dad was in called Torchbearer. The whole idea was compared to power, the the kingdom of God looks at power in a completely different way. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, even that movie, you think I think about some of the folks I made it with, I'm like... Yeah. I don't know if they understood what we were saying. I <laughs> because mean, because now it, they're the guys in power. Yeah, or yeah, work for a while. And, yeah, but you're like, you know, it's almost like the, you you see the the philosophy emerges. Like you think, oh well, we, when we get in power, we're going to be, we're not going to be like the other guys. No, but but you are. And I think one of the things that like classical, it's called classical liberalism, which is now called, I guess, conservatism. If that's even a thing anymore, but. It's the idea is that you you really take into account the depravity of man. You know, you take into account that that you know Lord Acton said that uh, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it's you take this into account. The only difference, the only caveat to that statement is is Jesus, and, or, or you know the the God of, of of the Bible. You know the the triune God who is absolute power and is absolutely uncorruptible and that's what you see though displayed in in the gospel it's what you see displayed in in jesus himself and this idea that that the god who has all the power the one who creates the cosmos the one who speaks it into existence is so much bigger than we could ever comprehend and then here he is in a human body in the form of a man named jesus Emmanuel, God with us, riding on a cult, going down into a city, going into into a temple that it, it just it just what's going on here in this whole passage and everything that's happening in the New Testament is is a testament to the kind of God that we serve that is not only is he uncorruptible, he is a God who who humiliates himself. Yeah, exactly. And does it for us. I wanted to yeah. say one more thing before we go to overtime. The, the whole point of me going through that history was that the cross up until Jesus was a symbol of Caesar being Lord and Savior. Because if you defy him, you're dead. That's why they hung people on crosses. They say, you don't cross us. Yeah. This is what happens. But Jesus took that. And made it into a love story. And, and, and I think you see years later when Paul and all his writings saying that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And then he talks about his love that he had on the cross. And that's ultimately how Jesus defeated them really at their own power struggle. Yeah, which is ironic about the triumphal entry. It was actually the one of the cross that 
caused us to triumph. But yeah. we'll talk about that in our overtime segment. We're out of time. Uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where you can go for that. We'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.